All right, this is an amazing area of Scripture. Last week, the title of the message was From Glory to Greater Glory. And this week is, the title is That Greater Glory that we went to from the other glory. So, uh, in review, up above there, from glory to greater glory, we um, looked at verses 7 and 8 of chapter 3 of Second Corinthians, where the Apostle Paul writes, But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away. How shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So, when Moses went up on the mountain, and we talked about this, when you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston, how many ever saw that movie? Um, when you saw that movie, old Moses went up the mountain and God wrote the Ten Commandments on tablet. Uh, he, first he cut out a couple out of the mountain, a couple of t- stones, and, and then he, uh, on those stones, he engraved the Ten Commandments. And uh, when he did that, Moses carried them down and the children of Israel were worshiping a golden calf. And Moses got angry. Now it didn't happen... The movie, The Ten Commandments, mixed a, a, a couple different accounts there uh, from the story of Moses. When Moses threw the tablet down and the ground opened up and swallowed some uh, people, that was at another time. This time, Moses just um, took the tablets and threw them on the ground and they broke into pieces. Uh, of course, the ground was rocky. It was the side of a mountain. And... Um, and it was a gruesome day that day because Moses shouted, All who are on the Lord's side come to me. And everybody from the tribe of Levi went to Moses. And they uh, became the high priest that day. Uh, I mean, the priest. Um, they all chose God when the rest of the uh, tribes were sinning against God. And they had a horrible order given to them by Moses. They had to walk through with swords, the other... 11 tribes and and they killed a lot of people that day and that was the judgment on God for the golden calf so then God said this time you cut out the tablets so Moses went and found a um, good area and, and cut out of the rocks a couple more tablets and he said come on back up and God rewrote the ten commandments on the tablets that Moses had cut out of the rock so Moses was up there two different times getting the, uh, that small portion of the law, the Ten Commandments, from God. This time, when Moses came down, the experience that Paul's writing to the Corinthians about took place. It didn't happen like in the movie from the burning bush. It happened the second time he was on a mountain. He come down, his face radiated so much with the glory of God that the Israelites couldn't look at him, and so they had to put a veil over Moses' face. And we talked uh, last uh, two weeks ago, last week was Easter, we had a different message, but two weeks ago when we studied this, uh, the question is, how long did Moses' face shine like that? And nobody's sure, but some of the commentaries believe it was till the day he died. So we really don't know for sure. But Moses, or Paul was writing here about that. He's comparing two agreements. Agreements with God's people and God. The first agreement was between God and Israel. And the second agreement, the New Testament, between God and whosoever will. Whoever comes to Jesus. Jew or Gentile. Jew or non-Jew, in other words. So, he, um, God is looking at all this. And, uh, I mean, Paul's looking at this and said, certainly in that Old Testament, there was some glory. Moses, standing up there there in the presence of God, well, God writes the Ten Commandments in the tablets. It was a glorious experience that impacted his physical condition. So he said, it's undeniable that there was glory attached to the first agreement. 
Now he's drawing comparisons. If that's true, he um, look at he said in verse seven. If the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, Paul talks about the Old Testament. Now there's a lot of history in the Old Testament. A lot of things prophets prophesied. Uh, you know, the last 17 uh, books of the 39 of the Old Testament are prophets. The first five are what we call the uh, major prophets, and then the next 12 are the minor prophets. And so they're all uh, not so historical. They're recording prophecies of the various uh, 17 prophets there. Well, um, actually 16. One of them wrote two books. But at any rate, before that, you had a lot of history. You had five books of poetry put in there, starting with um, Job and then Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, I'm forgetting, and Proverbs. Uh, those were poet. Um, what I'm getting at is a lot of history. But the first five books of the Bible are called the Pentateuch. And the last three and a half of those, Genesis is all history. The first 20 books, of, uh, 20 chapters of uh, Exodus are history. And then there's history in the next 20. Exodus had 40 chapters. But intermixed with that history, God begins giving the law, starting with the Ten Commandments. And then the next three books, there's history and law mingled. Throughout, God gives more laws. There's a lot of laws, not just ten. And Moses refers to that agreement God struck between man, uh, between him and Israel. He calls that the ministration of death. The ministration of death. I mentioned one time, I wish I had written a thing down, I'm going to have to go figure it out again, but something like 2,400 years between... Moses uh, lived three 40-year periods. First 40 years he lived in Egypt, thinking he was a son of Pharaoh, a grandson of Pharaoh. And um, the next 40 years he lived in the wilderness, tending sheep. And the last 40 years he was in the wilderness leading Israel as uh, they left Egypt and then they were, weren't able to go to the Promised Land because they sinned uh, with the sin of unbelief when they didn't believe God could give them the land. So they spent another 40 years. So 40, three 40-year 40 periods. So when Moses took Israel out of Egypt, toward the very beginning, he gets the Ten Commandments. I say that because God began giving the law to Moses. We don't know exactly. It could have been 81, 82. But somewhere around 80 years old, God began to give Moses the law. He lived another 40 years. But... Um, that's not what I'm getting at. So from the time God gave the law, when Moses was around 80, to the time Jesus resurrected. When Jesus resurrected, a new era started. But until that, there was somewhere around 2,400 years, if I remember right. And that law that Moses gave, guess how many people went to heaven because of that law? Not a one. The righteous dead, those who believed what there was to believe, and the sacrificial system covering their sins, went to a place called paradise. And it wasn't, it was a holding tank for the righteous dead till Jesus died and rose again. Then he descended there, preached the gospel to them. They all in that compartment readily received it. He took them to heaven. All right? 240 some year, I mean, 2,400 and some years. Uh, nobody got saved. Now, nobody got saved before then either. Nobody ever got born again until after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Nobody. And yet it amazes me how, pe- how many Christians want to go back to laws. Let's make more rules. Rules don't save anybody. in a dark dreary dungeon the only thing that saved me Jesus paid it all and opened the door cell and um, so Paul calls this 
the ministration of death. Why? How did it administer death? It told us everybody that was under it, they were sinners. It gave them all these rules that nobody ever kept. Only one man ever kept them all, and his name was Jesus, and he was the God-man. Outside of him, nobody was able to keep them all. So God had a part A and a part B to the law. Everybody kept breaking part A, so part B was the animal sacrificial system, where you offered sacrifices for your sins. And those sacrifices pointed to a coming perfect sacrifice in the person of Jesus. And so consequently, those who had faith in what they knew, followed God and had faith in what was presented at that time, and believed that the animal sacrifices temporarily covered their sins, those people went to paradise when they died. All the rest went to hell. So, Jesus comes along, He changes it. So, uh, I'm not going to spend any more time in the review. You have that if you want to look more into it. But the point I'm getting at there is, Paul sees it. Now, remember, Paul was a Pharisee before he got saved. Do you know what a Pharisee is? He's a strict Jew. He's a teacher. A strict Jew who teaches the law. And he's on his way to Damascus one day with letters from the consul to arrest everybody who's serving Jesus. And God knocks him off the donkey. And there he has an encounter with God, becomes a Christian. This man who used to teach the law now looks at the law as something that only ministered death to people. It was the best they had. It was from God, but it didn't save anybody. It ministered death. All right? So he said, even though it was the ministration of death, all we have to do is recount the story of Moses' face shining so much they had to put a veil over it to know there was some glory there. So, he said, if that's the case, then how much more shall the, in verse 8, shall the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? Now, dropping down to verse 9 in this week's lesson. If the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. I put two other modern, that's the King James, I put two modern translations under that, verse 9 and a couple other translations. One is the contemporary English version. It renders that verse, verse 9, this way. If something that brings the death sentence is glorious, won't something that makes us acceptable to God be even more glorious? The easy to read version. This is what I mean. The old agreement judged people guilty of sin, but it had glory. So surely the new agreement that makes people right with God has much greater glory. So Paul is talking about a greater glory now. He said the one brought death. Now it didn't... We're going to get into that. We're going to jump uh, to some other scriptures that Paul wrote other places. Uh, to other churches. But the law didn't actually kill you. But what the law did was empower something else to kill you. All right? So, let me give you an example. In the old days where they used to cut heads off of people, well, it's not the old days anymore, thanks to some of those idiots overseas, but um, when you used to have to actually stand before the king or whoever you appointed and you were sentenced to a beheading, the law, was what a king said in most of those countries, was law. So law had found him guilty, deserving the death penalty, but the law didn't kill him. But the person the law appointed killed him, the executioner. Well, it's going to be similar here. We'll get into this. The law didn't technically kill you because it was the perfect word of God. But something took advantage of the law and killed you. All right? We were all 
Before you accepted Jesus, everybody in this room was dead in their trespasses and sin. You were spiritually dead. Doesn't matter if you were better than your neighbor. You were spiritually dead. All right, now, let's look at this. We're going to look at some other scriptures. He said up there, if the ministration of condemnation be glory, how much more does the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory? And before I jump into uh, Romans 7 there, I want to say something. Just with a hand, how many have ever been pulled over by a cop and given a ticket? Me too. I don't understand that. I'm such a nice guy. But, uh, you know, the here's what cops aren't hired to do. They're not hired to pull Lynn A.G. over and come up to the window and say, Sir, we just pulled you over to tell you you were driving this speed limit. Good job. Go on. And walk back to the car. That's not the job of a cop. The job of a cop is not to compliment you when you keep the law. It's to catch you when you break it. Laws bring condemnation in every system at every time. Why does America have laws? So it can punish the people that are doing certain things. So they make these things against the law. Now when they catch you doing it, they can punish you, whether it's a ticket for speeding, uh, whether it's uh, robbing a bank, whatever it is. If you had no laws, you couldn't punish people for it. So the law brings condemnation. You did that. There is now a penalty. And that's what Paul's saying about the Old Testament law, the law of Moses. It's a ministration of condemnation. It's a ministration of death. Uh, Death up there in verse uh, 7, down here in verse 9 of condemnation. All right, now, look at Romans 7, beginning with verse 7. The Apostle Paul said, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, the Greek word for lust basically means to desire something. In the Greek culture, it wasn't always a bad word. In the New Testament, usually, with a couple exceptions, when you read the word lust, it's talking about lusting for something you shouldn't have. Desiring something you shouldn't have. Uh, doesn't have to be sexual lust. You desire somebody else's money. Um, whatever it is. If it's something that God doesn't want you to have and you desire it, that's usually what the Greek word we, that's rendered lust here stands for in the New Testament, with a couple exceptions. There's a couple exceptions where it talks about we lust for one thing and the Holy Spirit uh, in us lusts for another. There is being used just as a desire. The Holy Spirit desires something for our life and we desire something else often. And so when it's talking about the Holy Spirit, He's not desiring anything evil. He's desiring something good. So there's a couple instances where when it refers to the Holy Spirit, it's not referring to desiring bad things. But the rest of the time is talking about lusting after things that God doesn't want you to have. All right. So, he says, I had not known sin but by the law. I had not known lust except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. So when Moses' law, the tenth commandment of the ten, said, Thou shalt not covet. Now, it's longer than that. We just take the, that, the first few words. It gives us a list of what we shouldn't covet. covet. Uh, there's more than that, but it gives us a list of examples. But when it said, Thou shalt not covet, Paul said, I wouldn't have understood what lust was or desire unless the law had come along and defined it by saying, You can't covet that thing. So the law comes along, You know, you're a little child. One day, Morgan's going to be looking at some cookies, and Lexi's going to say, you can't have a cookie because it's supper in 15 minutes. 
And Lexi's going to come back in the room and Morgan's going to have cookie crumbs all over her chin. Temptation. <laughs> and Lexi's going to say, did you eat a cookie? And she said, no. <laughs> We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. As the parent and as the cookie thief. We've all been there. And so uh, we just like those cookies and we don't want to wait. You stick, if Barb says, I've been cooking all afternoon while I get home from work. Don't eat anything. If I pass an ice cream stand, she's in trouble. And then I'm in trouble. Uh, because the law is said, don't eat until you get here. And so Paul said, I wouldn't have understood what was right and wrong if there wasn't a law to explain it to me. So he's saying the law isn't evil in verse uh, 7 of Romans 7. Verse 8, here's the villain that takes advantage of the law. But sin, you say sin isn't a villain, it's, it's an act. Yes, it is. Sin is an action. But Paul oftentimes, to drive home a point, to make you see a picture, personifies something. He makes sin an individual here to drive home a point. All right? Uh, if it's easier for you, think of the devil. Uh, the devil is an individual. But Paul's trying to teach on the concept of sin. So he personalizes, personifies sin and makes him Mr. Sin. So he says in verse 8 there, But Mr. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, Rod in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was death. Verse 9, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, I have a couple examples that I'm not going to read. They're good. Vincent and Robertson there at the bottom are Greek scholars. New Testament Greek scholars. And uh, they comment, not all commentators agree with them, but I do. And I'm the one up front right now. Uh, so, they they talk about what Paul is talking about. When was Paul ever alive without the law? The law had been in effect for 24, 500 years before Jesus uh, died. Paul was about Jesus' age. Maybe a bit younger. So, Paul was never alive without the law. So, those two Greek uh, experts hit on the head what I think he's talking about. He's talking about as a child before you reach the age of accountability. Before you have a firm grip on right and wrong. Uh, you hear rules from your parents. But you don't fully understand them. You just understand, oh, if I don't do that, I'll be in the corner. But I mean, uh, above and beyond that, you don't get it much. But someday, we reach an age of accountability where God now holds us accountable for our actions. You say, what age is that? I don't know that it's a set age or if, if it's different with some, uh, with everyone. Some people never reach it. The severely retarded. Yeah. They never reach the age of uh, accountability. They never know right from wrong. So there is a sense, I'm going to shock you here. There is a sense in which the severely retarded don't need to get saved because they've never had any sin recorded against them. They've done wrong things, but they didn't know better. The reason we believe little children go to heaven when they die is because whatever wrong they've done hasn't been recorded against them. Now we might, for our own benefit, we might pray with our three or four year old and have them accept Jesus. But do they understand that? If they're old enough to understand that, they're at the age of accountability. Uh, the point I'm getting at is we kind of do that. We want to feel good and certain about them. The truth is, until you reach the age of accountability, there is no sin recorded against you in heaven. None. So, uh, he said, I was alive without the law once. In other words, had I died as a small child, I'd have went to heaven. I wasn't spiritually dead. Now, there's little Morgan here. There's a sense in which she is spiritually dead. In the sense that, um, the human nature is in her. You don't have to teach her to tell a lie. I mean, uh, you have to teach her to tell the truth. Right. It's human nature to lie. Oh, yeah, 
for the children. I didn't eat the cookie. I don't know how these crumbs got on me. Nobody has to teach a small child how to lie. Nobody. Parents have to teach them to respect and tell the truth. They have to train them. Train up a child. And so, uh, Paul's saying, this thing called sin, this individual that I'm personifying, when I got to that age of accountability, I understood the law. The commandment came. I now had an understanding of right and wrong. And then at that point, the first time I sinned, I died. I was spiritually dead at that time. There's a sense in which I was spiritually dead in Adam from the day I was born. But not accountable for that until the law came, the commandment came, I now whoop, the lights go on. Yeah. As parents, sometimes you think I can't wait till the lights go on with them. My wife's still saying that about me. But anyway, one of these days, I mean, the lights will go on. Uh, maybe it's a fuse. But did sin, what does sin do with the commandment? Here's the problem. Sin takes the thou shalt not and makes it sound good. Yeah. Why not? Why That's shouldn't I do that? It didn't start with Moses' law. It started with the Garden of Eden. There's only one rule. God, in essence, told Adam and Eve, do anything you want, anytime you want, except don't eat of that tree. That ought to be easy to do, right? Except the, except the serpent, the devil come along and said, yeah, but that's a good looking fruit there. Yeah. You know why God doesn't want you to eat it? You'll be like him. And so the devil come along with just one rule. And the devil made that one rule, the one forbidden, look good. And he enticed Eve until it said, and she saw that the fruit was something to be desired. And she ate of the fruit and then gave it to Adam. I'm thinking, man, mankind couldn't keep one rule. And we keep thinking if we write a few more rules, everyone will shape up. It doesn't work that way. So Paul said, um, sin works in me all manner of concupiscence. Now concupiscence means evil desire. So, sin takes advantage of the law. The law said, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. And sin comes along and says, but this, 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 and that. Oh, man, are they fun. You would enjoy that. So, he works a desire in the individual to break the law. Flip it over there, verse 10 and 11. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be on to death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me and by it slew me. Now again, I told you concupiscence means according to Sayer's Greek dictionary, desire, craving, longing, desire for what is forbidden, lust. But occasion here, sin taking occasion, it's a military term. The Greek word here is a military term. I always tell people if I want to know what an English word means, an American English word means, I go to a dictionary, a Webster dictionary, some other such thing. Nowadays I go to dictionary.com. Uh, but nonetheless, you go to a modern day dictionary that explains the meanings of English words. If you want to know what the, remember the New Testament was written in Greek, if you want to know what the Greek words mean, you go to Thayer, Strong's Concordance, some of those uh, people who gave us definitions of the Greek words that were used. And the Greek word used here, occasion, where it said sin taking occasion by the commandment means a place from which a movement or attack is made. A base of operation. So, when it said sin taking occasion by the commandment, it's saying that sin took the commandment and made it its base of operation to go after you. It became his point of attack. He took advantage. He said, I'm pitching my tent here. My generals are around me. This is where we're going to attack from. From the law. And he attacked 
by working all manner of evil desire than it is we already read. Now, Paul refers to the Old Testament, the law of Moses, as a ministration of death because everyone who breaks his rules dies spiritually instantly. When Adam ate the forbidden fruit, he also died instantly. That is, he died spiritually. Also, his body began to age, meaning physical death had set in. Because remember, God told Adam and Eve, if you eat of that fruit, thou shalt surely die. The devil said, ah, oh, thou shalt not surely die. Well, he didn't. they didn't physically drop dead when they ate the fruit. But two things happened. They were immediately spiritually dead, needing a Savior. And they immediately, their bodies ceased to be eternal, and aging set in from that day on. So, you know, there is a sense in which the day you were born, you began to die. You're ripping days off the calendar until you get to a certain age, whatever your age might be. Uh, and you're on the journey toward death. Or hopefully the rapture. Uh, again, there's a lot of great teaching on Bible prophecy. Lynn gave me the greatest teaching of all. I now know when the rapture is going to occur. He said it will occur the day after he dies. <laughs> he's, he's, yeah. He thinks he's going to die one day too soon. So if I call you and tell you that Lynn has passed away, look up your redemption draws nigh. Tell everyone you know, for the next day is the rapture. I have Lynn's word on that, all right? So, <laughs> anyway, let's go on. What does Romans 7, those uh, verses 7 to 11 that I uh, just shared with you, what do they tell us? As a child, I was morally alive until I reached the age of accountability. Then one day I understood the difference between right and wrong. The commandment or the law came. Then I sinned. Or I broke the commandment, verse 9, the first one, verses 8 and 9. When I broke the, the commandment, the very law that intended to make me live right instead killed me. Uh, verse 10, then the sin, the breaking of the commandment, tricked me into thinking that the breaking of that commandment would result in an experience that I would enjoy. In other words, it built desire in me. And in doing so, I sinned and I was spiritually slain by that sin. Yeah. So, sin is what actually killed you. Yeah. Not the law. But sin took advantage of the law to build evil desires in you. If there was never a forbidden, we'd have nothing to worry about. I like that. But I tell you, when there's something about the fallen nature when someone says you can't do that your mind tries to wrap yourself around it why not why can't I do that I'm a free man what do you mean I can't do that and sin is enticing you in that area alright now another area in Romans Romans 5 verses 20 and 21 moreover the law entered why did God give us the law if it didn't save anybody well, two things. One, he had to have an order to live by until Jesus got here. Every civilized society has laws. Uh, so that was one thing. But there was a deeper reason. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That same verse in the easy to read version. The law was brought in so that more people would sin the way Adam did. But where sin increased, there was even more of God's grace. Now, what what that translator mean? Sin the way Adam sinned. There were sinners from Adam until Moses. But no one yet had sinned the way Adam sinned. Adam's sin was a specific kind of sin. And the law came to make us all sinners after the uh, same in the same way that Adam was. How did Adam sin that nobody sinned from from after Adam to Moses the same way? Adam broke a commandment, a direct commandment of God, don't eat of that fruit. Now the law come along, and in Romans 5 here, he tells us we were all sinners. Everybody was a sinner between uh, Adam and Moses, but they didn't sin the same way Adam did. 
They didn't break a command. They were sinning against conscience. They were sinning against common sense. They were sinning in a lot of ways. But they were sinners because they were born into Adam, the fallen man. All right, now, so he said, The law entered that the offense might abound. Now, verse 21. And as sin has... But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. So what's he telling us here? How did sin increase because of the law? It increased because now people had a clear understanding of what God Almighty sees as right and wrong. We are now living in a society in America where politicians stand up and say, I'm a Christian. And then, then they push things that God explainly, I mean plainly explains to us, He considers sin. And they push it. Saying, I'm a Christian. Well, if you're such a Christian, you know what Christian means? A follower of Christ. Yeah. If you're such a follower of Christ, why are you saying He didn't know anything about righteousness? You have to redefine it. So they're coming up with all these rules calling things right today that the Bible calls wrong. All right, now, again, there's a teacher whose room I clean that had her students, she's a literature teacher, read some book on, uh, uh, some book where the main characters were Puritans. And I read some of her comments on there that where she... uh, kind of looks down on the Puritans, they believe the Bible was the absolute authority. Yeah, I do. I'm not a Puritan. Um, My belief system is uh, different. Uh, To me, um, um, you know, Puritans were somewhat like a mix between Presbyterians and Amish. Like the Amish, they didn't believe in any kind of violence. You hit them, they're not going to hit you back. Uh, Like the Presbyterians, they believed in divine election. Um, you hit me and I think you're bigger than me or tougher than me and at my age that just about includes every one of you Uh, first thing I'm going to do when I'm picking myself off the ground is I'm going to be looking for a big stick Um, I thought all right, I'm not going to stand there and let you hit me a second time Now, there is a sense in which Jesus had turned the other cheek, but uh, he's talking about other things there. He's not asking you to just stand there and take a beating. Uh, Unless, I draw a line here, unless you're being persecuted for the message of the gospel you preach, Uh then you follow the example of Jesus and just stand there and take it. You don't defend yourself if the reason you're being persecuted is because of your stance on the gospel. Now, we become more important to God in our martyrdom than we might have ever been in our life. We don't defend ourselves in those deals. But if some stinking drunk man hits me, I'm looking for a stick. You know, I'm, I'm, beating, I'm not going to turn the other cheek in that case. All right. So, I'm not even sure how I got into that story. But it doesn't matter. Romans 7 down here two more verses we did verses 7 to 11 on the other side and finished them on top of this side now the next two verses verses 12 and 13 wherefore the law is holy why is it holy? God gave it what did I tell you? what makes you holy? you're not holy because you gave up a bunch of bad habits and established a bunch of good ones there's only one way to be holy before God now, when you become holy before God, it will affect your conduct. But it's not the conduct that had anything to do with it. It's only one way to become holy before God, and that's for Him to write His name on you. In the Old Testament, the temple was holy because God said it's mine. In the Old Testament, the utensils in the temple were holy because God said they're mine. In the Old Testament, the sacrificial lambs were holy. God said they're mine. Israel was holy. God said, you're my people. The city of Jerusalem was holy. God said, that's my city. What do they all have in in common? They were in God's pile of stuff. 
The word sanctification means got to be separated from a profane use to a sacred use. In other words, I'm holy. Remember the word sanctify and holy are the same Greek word. They're the same word for some reason the translators render it one way one time and another way another. But I am holy or sanctified because God took me out of the world's pile of junk and put me in His pile of stuff. God wrote His name on me and said, You are mine. That's why I'm holy. I'm holy unto God because I'm His property. Paul said, No, you're not. You're not your own. Let me say it again. I am His property. I am owned by Him. I am not my own. That makes you feel like a slave. Deal with it. If you're in God's pile of stuff, it's because He wrote His name on you. You belong to Him. I am holy unto God. The challenge isn't to get holy. I get holy by putting, uh, accepting Jesus into my life. The challenge is to walk that holiness out. To walk like a Christian. I am a Christian, now I need to walk like one, live like one, okay? So, Paul said, the law, because it was given by God, is holy. And the commandment is holy, just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me, God forbid. He's saying it wasn't actually the law that killed you. It brought death to you, but it's not what killed you. Again, verse 13, With that then which is good made death unto me, God forbid, but sin, there's the villain, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Now today we'd say exceedingly, but there it was exceeding sinful. All right, so... God wanted mankind through the giving of the law to the Israelites to understand how terrible sin really is. He also defines sins that we know exactly what God deems to be sinful. You know God said, I am the Lord thy God, I I change not. Did you know the scripture said he's not a man that he should repent? Repent means to change your mind. What God thought he still thinks his thoughts are eternal when God defined sin I'm talking about not the when God said you have to sacrifice an animal that was pointing to Jesus he didn't change his mind on that he simply set that up to take him from the time the law was given to the time Jesus died and then they were separated with a once for all sacrifice by Jesus we never have to have animal sacrifices to cover our sin. Now, God has never changed His mind. If He called something sin, it's sin. Yeah, right. People are changing their mind in America as to what's right and wrong. Yeah. And they're calling Christians haters if we won't bend and yield. Because they think we need to be politically correct. And you hear me say it a lot. Martin Luther, when they wanted him to recant his writings back in the 1400s, said, my mind is held captive to the Word of God. Here I stand. I can do no other. Those words could have had him put to death. He wouldn't do what the authorities wanted to do. He knew it could cause him his death. He said, can I pray about it overnight? They sent him back to a cell. He prayed all night. He came back and said, My mind is held captive to the Word of God. Yeah. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. That's all I and uh, we need to be that way. Uh, it's not becoming, it's no longer a prop. You know, for years in America, it was popular to believe uh, the Bible's idea of what's right and wrong. Matter of fact, the founders. Uh, set up uh, laws based on what the Bible calls right and wrong. But now today, there's two things that many politicians don't want to be absolute anymore, that have been absolute since the beginning of America. The Constitution and the Bible. They don't want those things to mean what they say anymore. They want to be able to have judges in there 
that'll read the Constitution and say, here's what I think it means, instead of what it says. And we got people wanting now the church to read the Bible the same way. To read the Bible the same way. They want us to read that God is love and therefore it's all right to do whatever you want. He's going to take everyone to heaven. I would to God that was true. I would to God that was true. I don't want no, no one to go to hell. No one. But the Bible is pretty clear that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. Why is that? The way that leads to life is only wide enough, listen to me now, for one door. And Jesus said, I'm the door. Every other door on the planet is on the wide way. And none of them lead to life. You know, uh, Price is right. They used to have, what, no make a deal. They had three doors or something. You had to pick one. And you hoped to pick the right one of the three. Well, I'm going to tell you what. In the spirit world, there are millions of doors and there's only one right door. You can do things a million different ways, but there's only one way that leads to life. Jesus said, I'm the door. Jesus said, there's no man comes unto the Father but by me. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You must go through Jesus to get to heaven. All right, so... He's saying there in verse 13, it wasn't really sin that killed you. I mean, the law that killed you, but sin that took advantage of it. Again, in what way was, uh, as we wrap this down, was the uh, ministration of death glorious? It was glorious in the sense that God gave the law and it made Mo- Moses' face shine. Um, and what other way was it glorious? Well, we now have a record of what one individual views to be morally right, morally wrong, and that individual happens to be God Almighty. Uh, in today's world, and that's what I've been talking about. Don't have to go through that. Now listen, if you don't believe in the God of the Bible, then none of this matters to you. Anything I say. If you're an atheist, what I say has no meaning to you. I, I'm just preaching fairy tales to you. If you're an agnostic, you guys say, oh, maybe. But it doesn't really impact your life. If you're a Buddhist, nothing I say from this book will have any impact on you because it's not the book you follow. If you're a Hindu, same thing. What I preach from this doesn't interest you much. Uh, If you're a Muslim, you're not interested in anything I preach from here. I can tell you if you're a radical Muslim that Jesus wants you to love folk. And they'll say, no, no, He wants me to kill all who don't follow Allah. And so nothing you say is going to matter. Or if you follow some other God. You know, in the dark jungles of South America and Africa, there are people that have all kinds of gods. And now some of them, when the missionary gets there, begin in time to believe this book. But when the missionary first gets there, it doesn't matter what they read out of this book. Uh, It matters... Uh, if you believe in a particular God they have. So the only people that are interested um, in what the Bible has to say are Christians. Now, if you call yourself a Christian, like many politically correct individuals do, and then you set out, now listen, you set out to redefine what God calls right and wrong, you are a Christian in name only. You are not following the God of the Bible. If you think that you have a right to change God's laws, then you can stand up to get votes and say all day long, I'm a Christian. In America, that simply means you believe in the God of the Bible. It doesn't mean you follow them. When they take surveys and say 60%, 60-some percent of Americans are Christian, it doesn't mean that there's 60% of Americans that are actually following God. They simply believe in the God of the Bible. That's the religion they identify with. But if you identify with Jesus Christ, then you identify with His Word. He has the final say. In closing, Isaiah 5.20, listen to what the prophet said. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet, and sweet for better. So when we have people in America saying what God clearly identifies as sin in His Word, 
This is good. Their idea of right and wrong has the same value mine does. This is good. We accept this. I'm a Christian. We accept this. Woe unto them that call lightness dark. Call light dark and dark light. Amen.